amit nekem értetésekben a Egyetlen a Szentőt, a Politidállam, Szibi, Dr. Masura Reyes, Chairman and Founder, Policy Exchange Bangladesh, Mr. Yuji Amdo, Country Representative, Jezo Raka, Mr. Tarek Lafi, Guiyan Yunfan, Managing Director, New Vision Solutions Limited, Mr. Miske. As co-host of the seminar, Bangladesh Japan Relationship, Trade and Investment, I would like to say a few words for welcoming and introductory remark. First of all, I am delighted to that we receive so many audience to this event held in the Alex office of our industry. I would like to extend my sincere thankfulness to Dr. Pamiga and her team of CPD, the Center for Policy Dialogue, who have organized and hosted the event. I also heard, I also have heard that today's session can be accessible through social media after the event. I'm pleased that the contents of this seminar will be shared. Let me explain about the background of today's seminar. In February to March this year, Dr. Fabica, under the invitation program of the Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs, visited Japan to meet with prominent Japanese economists, intellectuals, and Bangladeshis active in Japan. She had a meaningful and fruitful discussion with them. One of the purposes of this seminar is to share her wonderful experiences and observations in Japan and her ideas on today's theme, namely, how we can enhance the relationship between Bangladesh and Japan, especially in terms of trade and investment. With regard to today's topic, we also invite the panelists to deepen the thoughts, deepen the thoughts. Taking this opportunity, I would like to thank all the panelists who accepted the invitation, namely Dr. Masura Rais from the Policy Exchange Bangladesh, Mr. Yuji Ando from JETRO, and Mr. Tarek Lafi Kuyan Jun-san from the New Division Solutions, as well as Dr. Famila Katun, uh, Executive Director of CPD. I do believe that this issue to be discussed is relevant to both Bangladesh and Japan now that the visit of Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hachina, was successfully undertaken last month. Now that the visit was over, we would like to move forward to follow up <coughs> on one of the issues that two countries have agreed. Regarding today's seminar, today at uh, trade and investment, we should discuss how we can improve investment climate in Bangladesh to encourage more FDI from Japan, as stated in the joint session agreed by two leaders. Furthermore, we should also take into consideration on moving forward the study on the possibility of the Japanese Bangladesh Economic Policy Agreement, EPA. EPA. There, are, there are so many aspects to discuss based upon the platform of the joint declaration. In this background, I am looking forward to having an excellent input from Dr. Farida, as well as fruitful inputs from panelists and audience during the panel discussion. Last but not least, regarding the deeply of the discussion, I am delighted to hear that Dr. Farida and her team are published in the book with reference to Bangladesh Japan in the near future. I'm honored to stop launching it in conjunction with uh, today's seminar. In conclusion, I am convinced that today's seminar will provide more impetus 
for bilateral relations between Bangladesh and Japan, which was elevated to strategic partnership for the next 50 years to come. Thank you very much to all. So I can come. Also, share her experience, the highlights of her recent visit to Japan, and also the soft launch of the book co authored by her team. So, the book is on um, Bangladesh Japan Partnership, the Next Development Journey, and uh, co authored by Amita Khatun, Sayyid Yusuf Sadat, Kashfia Ashraf, and Afri Mabu. So, now I'd like to request Dr. Amita Khatun to come forward and have a presentation. Good afternoon, Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and particularly the new uh, ambassador from Japan to Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. Ayoma Kimidori, and his colleagues at the Japanese Embassy. I would like to express my deep gratitude for this opportunity to share uh, some ideas on Bangladesh Japan relationship, particularly in the context of trade and investment. Um, indeed, today's presentation is the culmination of the work we had started last year on the occasion of Bangladesh-Japan's 50 years of relationship. Um, on that occasion, we had conducted a study based on the existing literature and also a lot of interviews both in Bangladesh and also in Japan, the experts and policy makers who had given a lot of inputs to our study. But um, as I can see from the gatherings of today, everyone, um, I know most of you, you're all engaged in the real work, uh, hands-on work, which is to improve investment and trade relationship uh, with Japan. So whatever I would say, it's nothing compared to what your practical knowledge is, but this is just to initiate the discussion. And I believe that me and my team would benefit a lot from the inputs um, of your um, you know, deliberations afterwards. So this presentation, uh, which Excellency has mentioned, that the, I had the opportunity to visit also uh, Japan um, just a couple of months back. However, that meeting was um, a number of meetings that were mostly to interact with the experts in Japan and also some uh, you know, policy makers who are in the government to understand uh, the, you know, how the Bangladesh and Japan's relationship can be taken forward and what is their thought on this. Uh, it's no doubt, it's uh, you know, undeniable that the relationship between Bangladesh and Japan is a tested one over the last five decades, but then we are living in a new era new time. So the dimension and the extent, the scale uh, and the nature of the relationship would also have to evolve uh, in the new context. So um, what I'm going to present, as I have mentioned, that I, it's uh, just to kick off the discussion on two particular areas, though relationship covers many areas, not only trade and investment, it's, you know, um, it's foreign aid, it's people to people uh, collaboration, education, health, technology, many other aspects. So, but just to these two, these two also covers all the others. So if we can fix or expedite this, enhance the viabilities, the others can follow. Uh, so I must say that I have uh, with me uh, my colleagues at the center, um, Mr. Yusuf Sadat, research fellow, Ms. Kashfiya Ashraf, and Ms. Uh, Afir Mahbu, they have been, um, they have given inputs and they are co-authors of this work. Um, and as the Excellency has mentioned, that we have also you know, published this, 
the author of the book, which is going to be published uh, in July. So uh, that will, that has a lot more information. Uh, so I'd like to thank that uh, my team also, and the, of course the Embassy of Japan in Bangladesh for their uh, support and collaboration. So with this, let me just you know, begin. Uh, the, I have about 25 minutes of time, so I will be mindful of you know, the, the time and many issues which I may also be skipping, which you already know. So we, as you know, that Bangladesh and Japan formally established its relationship uh, in fact, way back on 10th February 1972. Uh, though the relationship between the two countries predates the independence period. And uh, Japan also played a very important role, role during the war of uh, Bangladesh in several ways. In fact, not only within the country, but internationally also, Japan had uh, been by Bangladesh's side. The government of Japan, in fact, co-sponsored a number of resolutions on Bangladesh issues at the uh, United Nations Security Council and General Assembly in 1972. And in fact, um, afterwards, the Japanese government ministers, parliament members, intellectuals, and distinguished persons actively supported Bangladesh's independence movement, and even Japanese school children, they also donated their different money for the war affected people of Bangladesh. This is just to you know highlight the, how their goodwill and the feelings, the empathy uh, they have shown towards Bangladesh not only at the uh, policy level, but also among the common people. Uh, so now the context is that I have just touched upon that we are living in a different context. In the case of Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh is going through a dual transition and we know that it's going to graduate from the least developed country to a developing country status in 2026. At the same time, Bangladesh is also aspiring to become an upper middle income country from lower middle income country by 2030. So, apart from, in addition to that, we are also globally going through a change, technological advancement, fourth industrial revolution, which is going to um, intervene in our life in a positive way, but sometimes it also has you know, the fallouts. So, that is another transition we are living through. And Bangladesh has been Japan's largest, you know, uh, Japan has been Bangladesh's largest development partner. It has worked on many areas, including infrastructure, uh, industrialization, health, education, and also reducing the vulnerabilities of the people who are living behind. Now, the relationship, as I have mentioned, that I will look at to uh, look through the relationship from two angles. So one is the trade and then investment. So if you look at the just these are just some of the statistics which are already available, but this is just to show that how it has taken a transition over the years. So as right from the beginning of, of Bangladesh's independence, we have seen that how it has been improving. And of course it has fluctuated over time. Uh, as you can see, uh, um, this is a volume, but we have uh, observed that from 1997, uh, 1972 and, and 1986, the, there were this, in terms of percentage, it was large, because that time our export volume was also less, but then now it has reached so far that it is, you know, exp exponentially increasing. So this is the uh, export, and then in terms of import also, our import is in, with, with um, Japan is increasing, we are included. Uh, at this moment though, as a percentage of total import, it is about 3%. It has again declined because our import basket has import volume has increased. Though uh, in 1987 it was 16%, which was quite high. Now it has reduced because of our import uh, volume. But then in terms of volume, in terms of value, also it is increasing. So this is just to, to show that the top five exports, export goods of Bangladesh to Japan in, 19, in 2020. Uh, these are some of the you know, um, export items and we have shown the values also. 
ready-made garments and textile is important, one of the important ones, but then there is also leather, uh, and footwear, and also the you know, various types of um, textiles, actually. And these data have been taken from the International Trade Center. Then, uh, if you look at the five, top five import of goods from Japan in 2020, of course, uh, you know, vehicles would be the, the top uh, traditionally, and then in fact, Bangladeshi you know, the consumers have been heavily relying on vehicles imported from Japan. Then machineries and also other commodities, electronics, um, iron and steel. Those are also important import items from Japan. Now, the, um, if you look at the apparels, which is Bangladesh's top export item, uh, in the Japanese market it has been you know, increasing. In fact, in case of Japan also, it occupies 83% of total exports to Japan, which is quite large. And there are some categories <coughs> in the DHS code, and this figure also shows that, you know, which items um, share how it is going. The trend, uh, footwear and leather products. That's also an important product, export item from Bangladesh. And footwear, in fact, in, from um, it has increased. Uh, it was increasing, but then, as I mentioned, that in case of total exports, since the volume of export is increasing, the share has declined in case of footwear in terms of share. Uh, and also other leather articles, um, leather, uh, leather products and articles are there, that's about 4.1%. Um, in case of this, you know, by having said the export, actual export value and items, we also observe that there are untapped potentials, both the Bangladesh side and the Japan side. The actual export versus the potential exports to Japan, if you look, then we can see that we look at the graph which also shows that Bangladesh can in fact reap the benefits of additional export to the Japanese market, which is equivalent to 222 million for t-shirts and dress and cottons, as well as 67 million for men's trousers um, and cotton items. There are other also, this is the highest one, but for all other items, there are still untapped potential. So we can we can grab that market. Uh, if we can export, then we can increase our export value. Similarly, Japan's export uh, actual exports uh, versus potential export to Bangladesh. There also we see that there is an uh, opportunity uh, as well, and Bangladesh could import more machineries from Japan, as there is a significant uh, untapped potential for Japan to export, which is about 134 for the machinery, you can see that. So this is, these are the, you know, the actual versus the potential. If you can, you can see that for most, all the other items, uh, there are under potential. So now, moving towards the trade policies, what has worked for Bangladesh and Japan's trade relationship? What are the policies? Um, some of the important policies that those helped, for example, in 2014, Bangladesh and Japan adopted the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. This initiative uh, has been a significant tool for bilateral trade and economic cooperation. And Japan has been providing Bangladesh with a general system of preferences, which is called GSP, that allows tariff, uh, lower tariff and sometimes for zero tariff also for some products, then general tariff. And as an LDC, Bangladesh is also enjoying special preferential treatment, uh, tariff treatment in fact, which allows duty-free, quota-free access, market access for trade with Japan for 97.9% .9 of tariff lines, but excludes some products, that, that is fishing products, rice, sugar, articles of leather. So now that the world trade regime has also changed and we are seeing that multilateral trading system is not really going, moving that much uh, as we expected. So countries are entering into bilateral relationship, free trade agreements among countries, between countries. So if a bilateral trade agreements can be you know, signed between Bangladesh and Japan, 
that would open the opportunities for investment and trade um, and, and in the new context. So, in fact, as Bangladesh graduates and when this GFK uh, facilities will be withdrawn and we will, the MFM tariffs will be also, you know, which is very high, will be imposed then it will be very difficult. It will be applied in the Japanese market as well. So we will, our products will face higher tariff, which uh, much more than what we are facing now. So this is just to show that what kind of, what is the extent of tariff, how much it is. As you can see, for some of the products, it's much, much higher. MFN tariff, uh, tariff from, for example, for articles of apparel and clothing accessories, uh, that is from Right now, we are paying 0.14, uh, 0.14 percent. It will increase to 9.04 percent. Similarly, other types of apparel, 0.02 percent, will go up to 9.51 percent. Leather products, 1.57 percent to 10.7 percent. Footwear and other like products, so 2.96 to 38.43 percent. Other man-made textile and articles, 2.02 to 5.59%. Fish and other products, 1.52 to 4.38%. So it's some, for some of the products, it's enormous increase. So on average, it is 9 to 10% higher. So this is a huge burden, and it's going to have an impact on the competitiveness of Bangladesh smart taxes. Um, so this is something we'll discuss later on that you know, how we can move forward. Now, coming to the issue of investment. Um, foreign direct investment flows, inflow from Japan to Bangladesh has been increasing. This graph shows that there are fluctuations, but it has been increasing. And in 2022, um, this accounted for, uh, in fact, 123 million. So, um, we also receive ODA, that's different, but uh, FDI has been increasing. And in which, you know, this is just to show that which, for which type of product would, or which sector is receiving what amount of FDI. So this is a stock up to June 2022. So uh, fertilizer, um, $98 million. Construction, $56 million. Textile and clothing, 44 Power, $26 million and gas and petroleum, $17 million. These are the top five sectors where we are getting FDIs from Japan. However, you know, we talk about barriers of FDIs. So there are many indicators and some of the indicators, they are all related to time and other, other related you know, bureaucratic problems or sometimes cost also, direct cost. But these all amount to or lead to the cost of doing business. As we know that this is a huge bottleneck for Bangladesh. Um, this uh, figure, these numbers are taken from World Bank's doing good business, uh, good doing business index, of course. World Bank doesn't carry out this one, maybe this is 2020. But just to you know, give some idea that how much time it takes uh, to do different types of work which are related to setting up a business, uh, which doesn't really uh, show a very good picture. We don't have to compare with other, other countries, I mean, we have refrained from that. But just to give an idea, so this is, if, you know, if it takes about one year to do, a, or one year or more, to start a business, then, you know, you can, the initial investment cost would be so much higher. And, at that level also, we start losing the competitiveness. Um, then, in terms of other investment, we know that Japanese economic zone, which is being built in Arayadar Nara and Launch, that's uh, expected to be completed by 2030, which is a large uh, stretch of land, about uh, 1,000 acres of land, um, and many companies are investing. In fact, this uh, Japan is investing Three hundred uh, million dollar for the development of the, uh, of the economic zone, and also this, uh, as many other economic zones, 
Japanese economic zones are also subjected to tax exemption, income tax immunity on 50% of earnings from export, due to free export, cash incentives, facilities for bonded warehouse and duty drawbacks. Uh, and also this, as part of this uh, economic zone, uh, the companies will have basic healthcare facilities which will be available in the in Naranganj area. Uh, there are uh, there are some challenges also, but a lot of potentials as well. But some of the you know challenges are that this this was is being built in, a, in an area which is located near a river, which is not very conducive to foreign investors. But I understand that there will be more infrastructure to, you know, to commute better, smooth commuting, for smooth commuting. Uh, and also due to lack of direct, direct road connections, it may be difficult to attract. So this is one area where work needs to be done. Uh, moreover, the Chichagong Seaport, uh, which is far away, that is another challenge for foreign investors. But then these, all these can be, of course, overcome by improving the infrastructure roads and railways and all this. So that's one. And what is the potential? I mean, once this if it's a, a economic zone is complete uh, by its uh, by 2034, 100% will be occupied by various companies. And the establishment of the industrial unit will be uh, 128 by 2034. And it's going to create 61,330 uh, jobs, is that estimated once. So, which shows that the potential of this uh, Japanese economic zone. Now, just based on what we have discussed, some of the way out, what we have already, uh, I've already mentioned that the Bangladesh Japan uh, diplomatic relationship that can be taken forward by using foreign policy and also adapting bilateral trade agreements, bilateral trade cooperation, uh, and it will increase the accessibility to the Japanese market, which will also give, you know, um, duty-free, quota-free market access. And um, it will be obviously beneficial for both countries. The other issue which we have not is discussed here, but then that's another opportunity that we be, which is actually attracting other becoming an Asian hub that will also facilitate and strengthen the trade and development cooperation uh, with, between these two countries. Um, regarding the, uh, we are, I have mentioned about the LDC, post LDC regime, tax regime, in fact, tariff regime. Uh, so that will be uh, higher than what it will be about, it, the range will be from seven, average range of American tariff would be uh, from 7.4% to 12.8%. So in the post uh, LDC era, um, we, you know, as Bangladesh also globally is strategizing and also uh, requesting a state partner, the economic partner that post LDC flexibility should be extended for smooth graduation because uh, when an LDC graduates, just right from the next day, it can't really absorb the shocks it will be. The flexibility it loses. It's not possible to absorb that, those shocks you know, immediately. So that's why a grace period is required. It has been many countries have got. And Bangladesh should also uh, ask for it very actively. Uh, Japan can provide this. And our request is also to Japan that at least for three years that post during uh, post LDC graduation the flexibility the benefits, the tariff uh, you know, flexibility should be continued and also the GSP plus if uh, if eligible uh, that can also be offered by Japan like many other countries where we are advocating for that. And now, of course Bangladesh has to take preparation for that to fulfill the criteria to uh, to get the GSP plus facilities. Um, so and then, again, these are, uh, as we have mentioned, that you know, the sectors, trade, investment, but also agriculture sector is another potential area which can be also, which is, when you talk about agriculture, it's not only rice production, but then commercialization of the agriculture product, uh, that can also benefit from, you know, the export, you know, by exporting. Um, so the other sector, uh, potential sector, is care. 
that is, uh, Bangladesh has the um, demographic dividend. Almost half of our population is, uh, you know, young. But on the other hand, in Japan, half, almost half of their population is over 50 years old. So, uh, so people are lonely. People, though they have excellent uh, healthcare facilities, but then you need caregivers. At certain point in time, people also need, you know, human interaction, human touch. So. Bangladesh can take advantage of that. For that, of course, you know, Japanese policy makers also have to open up their healthcare sector. And in case of Bangladesh, the preparation is that we can have to develop. In fact, this is not an issue only for Japan. It can be also for other countries. This is a, because since Bangladesh is a large country with a lot of population and young population, if we can skill them, uh, and uh, cater their services towards the healthcare industry, then you can benefit from that. That is a huge potential for Bangladesh through, it's not a trade in goods, but trade in service. So we should also look for increasing the trade in uh, service. Um, so the, anyway, I'll not repeat this, some of the issues are, but other issues that there are a lot of, in terms of you know, expediting FDIs, Good Bangladesh has good, uh, very, um, uh, very uh, conducive um, FDI policy to attract for investment. But then, when we spoke to many investors, also that there are incentives and guidelines, but it's not clear. Sometimes there are those that you know, confusing. At the same time conducive business environment, that is very, very important. So what is written in paper and what is you know, actually being practiced, there is a difference. So bureaucratic complexity and uh, which increases the time, that's not really very healthy. So that's an area where we should be you know, um, improving ourselves. And also the transparency in terms of you know, various policies and procedures, those are also important. Um, the, some of the you know, problems or uh, predicaments faced by the potential investors, um, complex repatriation process, again, though in paper it's written, but then when you really want to do it, it is quite complex. Complicated procedures in customs, delayed shipment, lack of skilled IT professionals, inadequate internet connectivity, complicated foreign exchange regulations. So these are some of the bottlenecks we have. Uh, face. Also, of course, there is. Uh, this is a work in progress. But then we are a nation of 50 years old, so we need to actually uh, move fast, faster. Um, so that can help uh, not only Japanese investment but also other investments. So, in conclusion, I would like to reiterate only that there are a lot of opportunities for mutually beneficial. Uh, and win-win um, partnership uh, by uh, what we have built over the last five decades, we can take it forward. And at this point in the critical juncture when Bangladesh is moving towards uh, a developing country, an upper middle income country, then support from its partner is very, very important. And as I mentioned, that for a smooth graduation so that the fallout is not felt uh, so uh, deeply uh, support uh, is very important and also technological support that because investment brings technology and FDI is, is, what is one of the important vehicles for technology transfer but not only technology transfer it has to be coupled with also uh, skills know-how so that you know our human capacity uh, is improved that's also very important you know Investment comes wherever, you know, infrastructure, you know, infrastructure, technology, but also skill human resources. Those are the important uh, instruments for bringing, uh, attracting foreign investment. Um, so, these are my, you know, areas, I don't want to repeat what, but these are just, you know, just to highlight, just to reiterate some of the issues which should be uh, taken care of if we really want to take it forward. But in conclusion, I want to say that there are a lot of potentials, of course, and I think Japan um, has been one of the uh, tested partners, as I've mentioned at the beginning, uh, who really 
you know, the investment they made, the, uh, the trade they have done with us. These are really from the, from, it's really green. Really. It's not like one way. We have very uh, partners, Bangladesh economy uh, is small, but then there's a lot of opportunities and people are, and countries are looking forward to that, uh, to you know, partner with Bangladesh. But um, I think um, the dedication, the quality, the sincerity which Japan has shown so far, that's undoubted and unparalleled, I would say. So this is one country and one sort of partnership where we should invest our energy and time more sincerely um, than ever before. So these are my concluding remarks, but I will also, as in the beginning, um, the, the Excellency has mentioned that, so this is just to show a glimpse, I mean, this looks funny, but I just want to show that uh, some of the meetings I had. Uh, we live in an age nowadays, it's not 1960s that you know, someone has gone to Japan and then come back and say, oh, I have met these people and Japan is such a trivial country. We all know, but then just to show that, you know, my experience with that, with uh, Japanese experts and, all, uh, all, and also some policy makers, in fact, they are very, you know, humble uh, and polite, but at the same time, very focused, very sincere. There, there's a lot to learn from them. In fact, it is a mixture of, I, I've also seen it culturally, it is a mixture of West and East, actually. So, you can see that in terms of modernization, advancement, no less, far better than developed, Western developed countries. But at the same time, the culture, the values, moral ethics, much, much higher. And many, in many ways, it's similar to Bangladesh also. So it's, uh, and I did not say about their punctuality and their dedication. So um, so I had a very um, good trip, an excellent trip, and we had the opportunity to exchange that way we can work together from a, from a researcher point of view, of course. But they are all aware of Bangladesh. And they they have very good uh, you know, very good um, impression about Bangladesh. In fact, in the library, in one of the libraries, I was there. And I have found many books, including my book. So, so uh, which shows that they and in fact they are collecting by post. We nowadays we live in a virtual world. It's not you really can access digitally, but they have physical copies. They collect them. So that also shows that not how uh, how sincere and how. They, how much they value Bangladesh. Uh, so that's my um, about the visit, very short. Uh, and then this is about the book which you have mentioned, Excellency. The, this book is um, coming in July, but you can pre-order if anyone is in, interested. So we can have a soft launch. I took the opportunity to request the Excellency, uh, His Excellency, uh, to make a soft launch. It will just take one minute if we just stand and. Thank you very much for your patience. Today's panelists to come forward for the soft launching of the book, Bangladesh Japan Partnership, the next development journey. So, today we are really, really honored to have uh, Dr. Nasur Riyas, chairman of and the founder of Policy in Bangladesh, Mr. Yuji Andu, representative of Jaipur Dhaka, and Mr. Tarek Afikuyaju, managing director of New Vision Solutions Limited. So, I'd like to request you all to hold the cover of the book will be published in July and uh, for the food opportunities. Thank you everyone. And uh, now we will go for the panel discussions. We are really, really honored to have our honorable panelists for today's discussion and we uh, I would like to request Mr. Haruna Hiroki, Head of Economic and uh, Development Cooperation Division of the University of Japan, to be the moderator of this session. And we will have the question of the session together after this panel discussion. 
growing purchasing power and consumerism. As you know, again, HSBC, uh, Boston Consulting Group, they all envisage Bangladesh to be the ninth largest consumer market. 2041, Bangladesh's per capita income at a minimum is expected to be close to $6,000. So the middle and affluent class, their income is going to be much higher than that. And that class, just in the next four years, is going to be 35 million in size, larger than many countries' uh, total population. Uh, digital readiness, you know, 130 million internet connectivity, uh, uh, almost 75% mobile penetration. Uh, you know, a uh, very large sort of uh, young uh, online labor, sort of online labor pool or skills pool. Cost competitiveness, you know, Bangladesh, despite its productivity disadvantage, let's also be honest about the challenges. So productivity wise, we are at a disadvantage. But despite that, Bangladesh offers a very strong cost competitiveness. 47 to 84 percent savings when it comes to workers' age and uh, between 50, uh, uh, 10 to, up to 60% cost advantage over peers when it comes to online workers. Uh, and that is something that the global companies uh, sort of uh, end for. And finally, infrastructure need, according to the global infrastructure argument, $608 billion of investment required in different aspects of infrastructure till 2041. So that creates a huge attractiveness for this school factor. Obviously, Bangladesh, as I say, it was backed by very warm expectation and hope. Uh, uh, but I think uh, we see progress in terms of systematic investment promotion, but Bangladesh has a long way to go, and hopefully very soon, Bangladesh will match the pool factor to its push as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that there are lots of kind of bling factors from Bangladesh due to it's maybe economic growth or the demographic bonuses or uh, digital readiness or whatever you said. So uh, we have been pulled by uh, this uh, factor and uh, we have to uh, grasp or capture this uh, momentum. Uh, especially it could be uh, uh, elevated uh, partnership uh, thanks to the Prime Minister did it uh, last, week, uh, last month. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go to maybe the trade aspect. Uh, maybe I would like to uh, ask uh, Andosan about this question. And uh, as a general country representative, uh, you have been in a position to lead the discussion uh, on how to boost the trade and the investment between Japan and Bangladesh. So how do you think you can, uh, how do you think can Japan, uh, sorry, Bangladesh increase its exports to Japan after Bangladesh foundation from UBC studies? Thank you very much, Hansan, and uh, thank you very much for taking uh, a very really timely initiative uh, uh, for, you know, by the relations. So, uh, actually, this is also my first time to attend as a panelist. So, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but this concept is very, very simple for Japanese, especially for Japanese companies. Uh, you know, the cost reduction, uh, production cost reduction, or uh, uh, cost competitiveness uh, is a very, very important for that. Uh, increasing the export uh, from Bangladesh to Japan. But uh, to realize the cost reduction or uh, uh, production cost competitiveness, uh, you know, we need uh, uh, several factors uh, uh, we should realize. The number one is uh, uh, any uh, trade agreement, uh, as uh, Dr. Kamita mentioned. So FTA or one comprehensive one uh, economic partnership agreement, EPA, is a very, very important factor uh, to uh, increase the uh, uh, exporting of Bangladesh to Japan. Uh, because uh, uh, Bangladesh cannot enjoy the uh, GSP facility uh, for LDC uh, countries after 2027 uh, April. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, this trade agreement is uh, uh, one, uh, the most important factor uh, to increase uh, uh, exporting. And number two is uh, diversification in export basket is another factor uh, to uh, export uh, increase. As you know, the, uh, Bangladesh is uh, depending, uh, depending on the uh, RMG product uh, uh, as an uh, export product, but uh, we are needing a more value-added product uh, for diverse uh, uh, time export basket uh, from Bangladesh to Japan. But as you know, uh, Japanese companies might to diversify the supply chain uh, not only from China, ASEAN, but to uh, Bangladesh. So I think uh, uh, diversification in export basket is uh, uh, another factor uh, for Japanese company uh, to diversify uh, supply chain uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Bangladesh. 
And but, uh, in order to add uh, diversify the uh, export basket, uh, we need to develop the uh, backward linkage industries. Uh, you know, uh, we are now uh, depending on the importing of uh, procurement the, uh, the raw materials uh, like uh, you know the thread and yarns. So uh, if we can uh, procure uh, the raw materials from uh, Bangladesh, uh, it will directly uh, contribute to cost reduction. So this is another factor. So number three is uh, improvement in business environment. Uh, it's among the uh, most important factor. Uh, as you know, the, uh, for example, uh, when we are doing this here in Bangladesh, uh, uh, we are depending on the LC uh, settlement uh, for importing. But as you know, the LC uh, you know, settlement is uh, more costly as a telegraphic transfer. So uh, it's a business environment uh, you know, improved uh, in uh, uh, banking sector, uh, it will directly reduce uh, cost. So this is uh, one example. And another example is uh, a custom procedure. So as Dr. Mila uh, mentioned, uh, we are now facing the uh, challenges in the custom procedure. So uh, uh, if the, uh, this procedure is uh, you know, uh, uh, digitalized or, or uh, becoming a transparent, so uh, the uh, cost of uh, doing GS will be uh, uh, will be uh, drastically uh, reduced uh, in Bangladesh. So uh, this is another uh, example. So now Bangladesh is uh, trying to promote the more investment and trying to export uh, much more. So uh, Bangladesh government has to have that comparative perspective uh, in you know the business environment too. You know Japanese company always compare other. Uh, uh, you know, Bangladesh and other countries are uh, in business environment. So ASEAN, uh, we can say ASEAN is a you know, competitor for uh, Bangladesh. So uh, Bangladesh should, you know, look at uh, the ASEAN countries, uh, you know, to uh, promote and uh, improve more uh, business environment. So this is a uh, 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 factor. So uh, through, you know, uh, these factors, uh, we can realize a uh, uh, production cost, you know, a reduction or a uh, competitiveness. So these are the uh, examples uh, for uh, expanding uh, uh, export from Bangladesh to Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you touched upon, of course, our FTA and EBA and diversification of the industry and several things. And in that sense, uh, it is really uh, good that uh, we have established the uh, the joint study group from the EPA and that we have started the, uh, the first meeting in April. Thank you very much. Uh, let, uh, let's uh, uh, continue to discuss on this matter later. Uh, so next uh, question, I just want to touch upon a little bit of uh, maybe a labor or workforce uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, so Brian uh, San and Jen San. So uh, you have been working with uh, lots of Japanese companies and Bangladesh companies, and uh, you are very familiar with uh, those companies as well as the employees' uh, labor force uh, you know, in both countries. So having said that, uh, to what extent is Bangladesh uh, worker workforce, a labor force, ready for working in Japanese companies or even in Japanese society? Uh, thank you very much, Aruta san uh, Thank you, Embassy and also for uh, taking as a panelist. Um, I would like to start by uh, citing uh, Jetro survey. So uh, Aruta san did that survey in 2022. It was done um, you know, every year they do it uh, across the world, wherever there is Japanese investors. So uh, the very good result came in that Bangladesh you know, came in second for uh, like the, the companies who are wanting to expand their business in Bangladesh. But when they were asked about the challenges, 67% uh, say that uh, the um, skilled labor force, you know, uh, lack of skilled labor force is a challenge. So that really means that you know, we are not, uh, we, we cannot uh, provide the right labor force or the skilled labor force. So middle management and also the uh, skilled force is a, a big issue. If we would look at the same, um, the Jetro survey back in 2020, it was only 48%. So about 18% uh, increased in the uh, last two years. And uh, Dr. Fahmi also talked about it, that we are having a BSEZ uh, in Arihaja. So we are expecting you know, um, about 60,000 uh, employment uh, to be generated there. Uh, in some estate, it is even more. So
So that would mean that there will be a big void of, you know, that we cannot provide the right um, workforce to them. So if you would look at, you know, what is happening in other countries, like in our neighboring country, India, uh, they also have similar kind of problem. You know? So what they have done, uh, they actually, uh, you know, asked Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry, which is known as METI, so METI, and the Ministry of Skills Development and Entrepreneurship in India is actually building a skill development center for Japanese companies. It is called the JIM, so Japan Institute of Management. And it has a goal to train about 30,000 engineers uh, to Japanese center in the next 10 years. So we believe that you know, a very similar thing in Bangladesh uh, should be done. So I would uh, definitely request uh, the embassy also from the Bangladesh government side they should be thinking uh, to develop something like that so that you know, there is a lot of uh, good uh, skilled labor that can come up. And you know, it is, whenever we are talking about skilled uh, workers, it's not about just engineering and other things. There is also a lot of soft skills. So, you know, when we talk about the Japanese manufacturing practices, you know, we all always think about five years, Kaizen, uh, just in time, and other things like that. But, also, we really have to look into you know, how discipline and how timeliness and work culture is so important uh, for the Japanese uh, companies. So, you know, when, um, when we are working with a lot of Japanese companies, you know, we get these um, you know, complaints sometimes that you know, there is, uh, we need to actually train them more so that there is uh, the middle uh, management and the top management people who are going to graduate with the top management people, those are actually uh, getting more <coughs> skilled in these things. Uh, some good uh, things are that you know we have uh, Dhaka University Japanese uh, Studies Department, which is actually uh, getting quite a lot of uh, good graduates, and they are getting skilled in, in some of these soft skills. And also there is uh, you know, PJTI and some other organizations who are trying to uh, do those. So not all is bad, but we believe that these skills uh, from the government side also, because there is so many vocational institutes, we need to actually get some more of these uh, training like Kaizen, uh, Firebase, also the soft skills in them, so that they actually become a uh, better workforce uh, for the Japanese companies to come. Thank you. Very much, uh, Jensen. And as uh, we all know, uh, there have been an increasing discussion about uh, how to just uh, enhance or increase uh, like, uh, people to people education, as well as uh, how to uh, send a uh, skilled uh, labor force to Japan. In a sense, uh, it is uh, worth mentioning that uh, uh, the specified skilled workers uh, exams are can be taken now here in uh, Bangladesh, and uh, that of course there should be a lot more initiative we have to uh, proceed further. Uh, let's uh, um, discuss uh, on this later as well. Thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, touched upon investment in the trade and the uh, labor force, you know, based on what you have presented today. And uh, having said that, and apart from, for example, trade and investment, uh, do you feel that there are any other areas of economic cooperation between and relation to Japan? Um, thank you. Um, I would emphasize the point what June has just mentioned, that skills development but um, another area I would like to also emphasize, which is the um, issue of the present and future, that is climate change. Bangladesh is a country which is vulnerable to the impact of climate change, and nowadays a lot of investments are being made to, you know, to transition from fossil fuel based uh, production system or fossil fuel based energy sources to renewable energy, and that's the future and that. You know, the global community has taken commitments in COP26. Bangladesh has also voluntarily uh, has um, this what is called nationally determined commitment NDCs. So unconditionally and conditionally both. It has a commitment to Bangladesh emits very little of carbon emissions. But uh, in order to you know, again compete in the market, global markets, to have market access, we have to actually produce clean way, clean up the industries, and production system has to be clean and clean. Um, and after 2026, when LCs, uh, graduation has happened, 
then not only compliance issues on labor aspects, but also environmental compliance will become very stringent. It has, in fact, already started in the European market. You know, you, many of you have also probably heard about the carbon border adjustment. That is, if you want to cross European markets you know, uh, for your export, you have to give, you know, declare that how much carbon content this product, any singular product, has. Which is, you know, to to the to very developing countries, it's sort of a uh, barrier, trade barrier. But then the fact is that this is a global norm, so which we may have to, so, you know, adjust to that. The preparation is needed, but for that, a lot of investment is needed. Uh, since Bangladesh is vulnerable for both adaptation and mitigation uh, is required, and for those, heavy investments are required. So Japan. In fact, you know, Japan is also uh, involved in Bangladesh's um, energy plan, uh, like this uh, master plan, energy master plan, which has a lot of targets for green energy and all of that. For that, how you can bring more investment. Well, this also means you know, business, good business. Uh, this is an area for investment, in fact. Uh, I would also like to say that adaptation, though the private sector does not want to invest, it doesn't give, give the money back, but there are a lot of nature-based solutions which can also make a business you know, sense. That is another area for the private sector to invest. Thank you very much, Shabar, for your very insightful uh, inputs. Um, I have been indecisive whether we should go to the second round or not due to the time constraints. But uh, I have noticed that uh, you know the, how to increase the uh, investment, which part we uh, and also mentioned. I kind of learned that uh, Mr. Ryo Sanga Junsan. Also, uh, you may have uh, some uh, you know comments or complementary words uh, to, to to that point. So if you have other uh, uh, say, please uh, 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 Thank you, Arthur. Uh, thank you. Arthur yes. and uh, So, no, I think, uh, as you say, rightly, I think uh, my fellow panelists already touched upon some of the areas which are going to be critical in terms of uh, strengthening to bring more investment. I just want to highlight two, a two areas uh, without going into specific laws, regulation, or policies. It is the approach that Bangladesh uh, will benefit from undertaking. First, uh, Bangladesh must move away from ad hoc general investment promotion practice. I mean, it has worked to some extent, not to a great extent in the past, but it will not work in the in the, in the coming years, and certainly not uh, the scale that the Japanese and Bangladesh side will envisage to, to which it will go to, and the level of sophistication will be required. So, Bangladesh will need to use more strategic openings. Uh, to, to make the entry point. For example, regional economic cooperation or market integration initiatives. For example, the big big, you know, Japan has kind of almost gifted Bangladesh with this big big uh, Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Initiative. And uh, we have heard Prime Minister Kishida speaking about Bangladesh's opportunities when he was in Delhi last month, I think, that how we can use uh, the developments in the southeast Matarbari and, and the corridor to create an economic corridor to which can cater to the regional markets, India, Iran, Nepal, and so on. And, and it makes perfect sense. And if we can take advantage of that, we can bring in more investment from Japanese companies doing infrastructure across the economic corridor, uh, energy, as Dr. Katun also mentioned, but also direct investment in manufacturing services and logistics, for example. Uh, second, Bangladesh should also move towards uh, integrated trade and investment approach. These two are quite separate. They don't speak with each other in Bangladesh. If we look at Vietnam, Indonesia, even India, these two are integrated. For example, India just published their uh, foreign trade policy. Bangladesh, while we have a great export policy and import policy order, we do not have a national trade strategy or a national trade policy, which would have given us the sort of complementary investment directions and then would have brought in 
uh, you know, instruments like uh, sort of economic partnerships, ultimately FTA. And the power of FTA, we heard from June, and I was uh, fortunate to speak at the Midway, and was presented last year. Uh, so many Japanese companies want to come to Bangladesh as their preferred uh, destination, but they also say when the GSP is gone, and unless there are bilateral preferential sort of trade agreements, I think maybe 52 or 62 percent say it will be uh, they lose the cost competitiveness to do business with Bangladesh. And when Vietnam signed FTA in 2008, their export uh, and, and 2008 to 2018 in 10 years. After signing FTA, their export rose, export to Japan increased by 116%. FDI from Japan in Vietnam increased by 81%. Thailand, 51% increase in export to Japan after they signed FTA in 2006. Japanese investment in Thailand, 243% increase by 2018. So that's the power that we're looking at, and Bangladesh must be latching on to this sort of strategic levers rather than going into ad hoc. Uh, fragmented investment. Thank you very much. A lot of people have been uh, pointing out that, uh, you know, including Anderson, the, uh, the conviction, the sense of conviction with the other neighboring countries as well. Just right here, as you said, that uh, it is very uh, important to be uh, mindful of that aspect. Well, having said that, uh, in, you know, in Junsan, I also uh, learned that uh, you may have some, uh, some uh, uh, other may some some comments to then complement what I just said. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, I, I believe that you know uh, for Bangladesh we have more investment in, in the um, from Japanese uh, investors. And the most important thing would be to make sure that all the investors that are already invested in Bangladesh are completely happy. So we need to look at the problems that they are having. So you know the Jetro uh, report. And we also, you know, when we talk to them, uh, some of the issues uh, that was alluded to earlier also, taxation policy, uh, then also the foreign exchange policy, uh, the customs uh, clearance, the timing that it takes, uh, the uh, technical transfer, uh, LC payment. Uh, these are some of the issues, uh, you know, the skills development that I just uh, pointed out last time. Uh, we have to look at these uh, issues and really solve these things in such a way that uh, the current uh, or all the people, whatever the Japanese company that come they definitely talk to all the current investors and they want to talk to them, they want to uh, understand all the problems, the uh, different kind of opportunities and uh, when they hear that you know, the problems that they're having, the incentives that were promised at the very beginning, uh, those were you know, uh, not uh, completely fulfilled or sometimes the uh, local company and the foreign company have a little bit of a discriminatory policy. Uh, those things are something that you know, we really need to address. And if those are addressed, I'm sure that you know, uh, all the governments are trying to keep the uh, dialogue that we are having. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that these uh, issues will be resolved in such a way that more and more uh, foreign investors will be coming. And because we are having our electronic zone and uh, so many other places, Thank you very much. Um, so now we are kind of getting closer to our uh, the closing, uh, but I uh, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, input uh, on the various points, including opportunities, um, challenges, as well as measures, uh, so the future aspect we have to consider. Uh, so, uh, having uh, had uh, all those inputs from uh, our eminent, uh, excellent uh, panelists, uh, I'd like to take uh, some uh, questions if you have on the floor. And uh, so, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand and the microphone will go to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Fabida and the uh, CBD team for that great uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Saeed Nassim Mansur. I represent Pila the Goods and Footwear Export Sector, as well as a company called Apex in Bangladesh. I'd like to start with uh, what Dr. Fabida said about I think the special bond 
that exists between our two great countries. Um, you know, the tiffin uh, money donation story is often heard, but we don't know how that has continued over the years. As a company, we have benefited from having worked with Japan since 1976. And when I started work in 1990, and after that when we had a big flood, uh, the Japanese importing companies, when they would come to Bangladesh, would choose to travel by economy class and donate the difference money to the Prime Minister's Fund for flood relief. I have worked with many countries over the last 32 years, and I am as old as that. And I've never seen another country like this. So I think Japan is more than a tried and tested friend. Japan is an ally. And I completely agree with uh, Dr. Riaz. I think the intent and the pull from the Japanese side is certainly much stronger than the push, that is something that we as Bangladesh well need to improve on. Um, in terms of the learning opportunities, I have the benefit of going to Japan on AOT as technical scholarships. And many people in our company have gone there. And it is a game changer. If you talk about quality control, Japan sets the bar. There is no country that does quality like Japan. So we have so many things we can learn. Now, very quickly, opportunities, because that's what we're talking about here. I would like to touch on a couple of points. First, manufacturing for the local market. I think Japanese companies have not looked at that strongly enough. The look is always, if I may say, what can I make in Bangladesh to sell outside? And as my friend Dr. Masuri has said, with a 33 million MAC population larger than Australia, the opportunity for specifically food, pharmaceutical appliances. In a country where Made in Japan is a brand, the only market where cars appreciate is Bangladesh. Because you can buy and name a car Range Rover, and the moment you buy it, it depreciates by 40%. But you can actually buy a Toyota Corolla and sell it for a profit after five years. There are very few brands like that, and Japan has that. So I think, how can we get Japanese companies to look more at the local market? Food. The trust factor for Japan in food is unparalleled. Manufacturing for the supply chain. If you look at capital-intensive manufacturing like synthetic fiber, man-made fiber, Anand Hassan, as we is popularly known, talks about it a lot from Jetro. It's incredible what can be done. These are areas where Japan can compete with the other countries because you bring in long-term capital. There is not a lot of long-term capital in the world. There is a lot of fast capital. Uh, I'm sure you talk about this. I think there is a lot of need for long-term capital. Japan offers slow capital. Third. As Jun San correctly said, Japan is still management. We've been dreaming of this for the last 30 years. Our neighbors are meeting us to it, but the time is still not over. We need to learn Japanese, not just technical, but management. And honestly speaking, the companies that have done well in Bangladesh through this kind of collaboration, that's a source of business. And I don't see enough Japanese companies coming and looking at this as a business school. How do we train Japanese quality managers? Right? How do we get them to that level? The four, manage, uh, manufacturing for, and I think they talk, talked about it in the paper, Dr. Fabida, not just for cost reduction. I think honestly, if I may say, we need to move beyond just cost. Country of origin diversification is the single biggest challenge for all importing countries. 65% of all apparel sold in Japan comes from one country named China. That's not a healthy situation. We offer you a solution, ladies and gentlemen. How much are we using that? If I talk about the industry I work in, footwear, uh, in 2021, it's a $1.01 billion import in Japan. Out of that, the single largest country is Vietnam at 201 million. The second country is China at 198 million. The third country is Italy at 136 million. The fourth country is Indonesia at 126 million. Bangladesh did 34 million. Untapped potential is Dr. Fami. Sky is the limit, but we need the continuation of those privileges. The FQF GSP beyond 27 April, 26 April, sorry. And last but not least, I think there is room for, grow, for great optimism. If I look, share with you the February 23 YOY growth numbers for import of footwear, the fastest growing country with where, from where Japan is importing more shoes, of course, Italy, almost 28% growth, 452 million yen. Second fastest country is actually Bangladesh, 94% growth. 197 million yen. But as Dr. Masuria said, there's no reason to be complacent. Thailand, thanks to the FTA deal, is growing also at 161 mm -hmm. percent. Mm -hmm. one, one last point in terms of suggestions. I really think, as Jun Sun said, please highlight success stories. 
And I think also, can we move beyond G2G to more B2B? I don't see enough B2B discussions, and I think that we can be a, your ambassadors to promote source diversification. And last but not least, this is the age of Asia. Let's compete together for the global supply chain. Thank you. Sorry, that question goes to Ms. Mamina. Any comments? Sorry, um, well, I think we've covered a lot. This is Ithi Islam from HE Capital. So, just two quick observations, and maybe then the panel can comment on. So, firstly, uh, we live in, as the expression goes, geopolitically very interesting times, uh, British understatement. So, I think that uh, whether you're talking about business or economics, commercial, we can uh, avoid the increasingly complex geopolitical environment that we're in. Uh, but I actually think that, that makes the Japan Bangladesh relationship much more important because Japan is uniquely placed at the moment in this region in terms of being a trusted friend in many, many countries. So whether we do have B or other uh, initiatives, we have to we don't have time today to discuss this, but that's very, very important. My second observation question for the panel, I think one area we haven't covered or we haven't covered today is actually about science and technology and innovation. So uh, my observation is that uh, with business <coughs> economics is that uh, yes, uh, I'm the absolutely talked about the demographic uh, deficit challenge in Japan and the demographic dividend in <coughs> Bangladesh. But I would add to that that uh, Japan is, in my opinion, one of the most in terms of science, innovation, and technology one of the most, if not the most advanced country in the world. So we have to combine this, this, this opposing demographics or complementary demographics with surplus savings from Japan and also science and technology. So when we talk, we think about the challenges of the major challenges for Bangladesh is uh, climate change, green innovation, uh, and also agriculture, food security. Um, but I think that maybe in a future discussion, we should focus more about how to combine, have much deeper innovation and science collaboration. And the last area I would, uh, you know, when I say agree, but respect, very respect that I disagree with my, my esteemed colleague. I think that uh, Japan's ICT sector is surprisingly insular. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, Japan, Japanese companies, particularly in technology and innovation, can use collaboration in Bangladesh as springboard to global markets, uh, both global developed markets and also so next time maybe we can uh, bring my one to the company side. Uh, uh, my name is Lee, it's the Ishii Corporation. Just briefly, uh, excellent presentation today and uh, kind of discussion. I would like to want, uh, add one point, a few points. Uh, in order to increase and leverage our international trading and also the investment, uh, we would like to also think about a little bit long-term uh, point of view, as uh, our friend Dr. mentioned, that uh, in case of Japanese company, when we say long-term and uh, strategic location of the investment, strategic means that we are not just thinking about final destination of uh, business only in Bangladesh, which is huge already, 170 million, but uh, we are not thinking of not only Bangladesh, but also the region. Our business is already in uh, and are kind of competitors, but we are already working in the region. So our playground is uh, ASEAN market, and also we are going to be playing in the South Asian market. So when we make a, when we always talk about the trading volume between Bangladesh and Japan, it's for me a kind of nonsense issue. We are not talking about the trade in between Bangladesh and Japan. We are trading with Bangladesh company or with Japan regionally. So in order to really leverage our uh, trading in the future, especially as after post-graduation 2036, in a long-term basis, our player may be Bangladesh and Japan, but our playground is region, uh, ASEAN, also maybe South Asia. In case of investment, that's the same. We try to work with a strategic long-term partner of Bangladesh in order to make a joint venture in Bangladesh. But our joint venture 
Japanese especially, except for some SMEs, we never think about Bangladesh as the final destination of investment, only thinking about Bangladesh domestic market. We do the business and we, we export the product from Bangladesh investment to outside, RNG area. We bring China material, we export to them. So our idea is that together with Bangladesh partner, our investment is only not only thinking about Bangladesh, but also the region. It is very important to think about that, that we are playing in the region, not only trading, but also the investment. Much uh, later the last, uh, sorry, the, the, the time constraint, maybe the, 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 the last. Thank you very much. Okay, then, then the last. Yeah, just, just, just. Uh, so, yes, this is uh, Professor Dr. Shortan Naim. I'm a surgeon and he studied at Tokyo University. Uh, did my PhD in surgery, transferred the technology from Japan to Bangladesh back in 1993, 30 years ago. And I trained a lot of surgeons, and that's Story of technology transfer. Now working in the health sector, and think everybody talked about the demographic dividend. At the same time, definitely we will have to make them skilled. If we really look into that, we will have to take that. As well as when we are enjoying the demographic dividend, but we are also going to encounter a huge number of elderly population in maybe 25, 30 years. So we have to get ready for that. So. When I was in Japan, learning surgery at the same time, when we have seen the social, uh, social condition, then we have seen how Japan is taking care of the elderly people. So I have gone for a project of this kind, the elderly people care, geriatric project. So what my point is, of course trade and investment is important, but education is also important. When we studied with the Japanese taxpayers money in Japan, we came back, transfers of technology, and we still wanting to transfer the technology of geriatric care. In such situation, we need Japanese investment in the field of, of course, hospital building, the geriatric care project building, where our young generation could be trained and educated, and with Japanese language capacity, we can send them to Japan. And we are doing that. Japan Biology Foundation is doing that. But still, I believe many Japanese investors should come forward to invest in the sector of health education, not to produce doctors, but to produce ancillary and supportive healthcare people, like nurses, paramedics, etc. Thank you very much. That's my comment was. Thank you. Very much. One last comment. Thank you. I have questions, not, not exactly comments. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the excellent uh, knowledge series uh, session. Uh, taking the clue of my uh, before that, I'm full government, I'm Secretary General, Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also one of the Chambers Federation. Uh, taking the clue uh, from uh, my former president, Mr. Seth Nassim uh, Well, uh, in order to increase the business, it's extremely essential for business to business contact. Uh, Excellency, can we consider to have some sort of special visa arrangement, uh, business visa particularly? Uh, uh, you see, uh, there are credible uh, business persons, those who are willing to travel to Japan and to see, and also to promote Bangladesh's potential to the Japanese consumers. So, from that aspect, if there are some arrangement, mechanisms we can discuss uh, later on, number one. Number two, uh, as another, another uh, uh, question, uh, as uh, uh, my brother has already mentioned, Japan has older and aging population. Bangladesh has really younger population. Can we set up a sort of a structured arrangement where Bangladeshi young talents could be trained, taking the considerations of the Japanese labor market, and then send them for a definite period, not indefinite period. We can discuss the mechanism later on. From the employer's perspective, we tried a little bit a couple of years back, but then we have not been able to really proceed far. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your input. Although I'm not the panelist, but uh, the first question is uh, uh, directly dedicated to me, and uh, uh, I should respond to you. Uh, 
uh, in broader terms because it's a very, very important issue. And uh, we do uh, understand that uh, due to the fact that uh, the economy is booming uh, between Russia and Japan, there's a huge demand uh, for uh, the, uh, going to Japan uh, from, uh, from Bangladesh. And uh, uh, because of that, and uh, in addition to that, I just want to add that, uh, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, uh, right now, April and May, is the time for uh, new students to go to the Japan for, uh, for study. And uh, because of that, uh, I uh, have to admit that uh, the, our issuing the, uh, the, the session section to this issue of the visa is very, very uh, <coughs> uh, congested. And uh, due to the fact that uh, that, that issue, uh, there should be some innovative ideas. And uh, uh, we should definitely look into uh, whatever the, uh, your innovative ideas and talk, uh, talk with uh, our colleagues. But the, uh, uh, as you may know that the visa issue and uh, the, uh, the immigration policy is a very, very complicated issue. So uh, uh, I cannot say, yes, we will do that and that, but the, uh, uh, I will gather all the uh, uh, innovative ideas uh, so that we can uh, discuss with my uh, colleague in, in Tokyo. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So sorry that time is up, and uh, I should have uh, invited the visa section today, which is not the case today. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you very much for your question. So now, uh, okay, just one minute. Yes, one minute. Just when you talk about the trade and investment, you cannot ignore that. That is my point. Okay, then. Because Japan is the very important country. They are considerably in this. Moreover, they are a bit conservative on the council of Mecca. I am the Japanese University Alumni Association president. We are working on the council of Mecca. We have the Japanese language school. We are arranging the Japanese language school since test. When somebody is coming in Bangladesh to invest, they, are, they want to search the culturally in this people. They want to find out. That is why. I want to add with the presenter. When you can add something about the cultural matter, that is, that is my problem. We cannot ignore the cultural thing, as because Japan is the cultural, they are very enriched. Moreover, they are a bit critical. They want to maintain their cultural intimacy. That is why we cannot ignore it. That is my problem. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for writing that point. Of course, uh, we have uh, uh, touched much importance of our cultural exchanges, and I will continue to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, for wrapping up, uh, I believe that uh, the, all the people here are kind of the big believers for the uh, brighter Japan and Bangladesh uh, future, and very keen to uh, strengthen our relationship uh, for further. So uh, thanks to the uh, Prime Minister's visit to Japan, our partnership has been elevated to uh, part uh, strategic partnerships. So we would like to uh, continue to work with you all here uh, for our win-win uh, brighter uh, future. Thank you very much. And having said that, I will just give my floor back to uh, 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 TV san Thank you very much, Hattu-san, for being a wonderful moderator today. And thank you very much to our honorable panelists. Dr. Mashurias, Mr. Yuziandu, Mr. Director Fifila Jun, and uh, Dr. Famida Khatun. So uh, now I would like to request Dr. Famida Khatun for her contributing remarks. Uh, thank you very much. In my conclusion, I have nothing to add but to thank all of you and for your time and for your input, valuable input. This is a working progress as I have mentioned, so we continue to work towards larger uh, partnership between Bangladesh and uh, Japan. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. I'm uh, sorry, I, did, I said this is my first experience with the moderator, so I forgot to tell you to give them a big hand for the moderator. Thank you.